Hi, you're watching Floyd Steinberg's YouTube channel. Today, let's take a look at how you can build your own MIDI controller or MIDI filter or whatever MIDI processor using a Raspberry Pi and some stuff you probably have at home. And I've tried to explain all the basics you need to understand how this works. And our goal today is to build a controller that can read one or two faders and convert their positions to MIDI data. Here we go. So our goal for today is to build a very simple MIDI controller with one knob that can control through the cutoff frequency on any given synthesizer. And in order to achieve that goal we need to take three steps. The first one is to gather and assemble the hardware, second one is to install the operating system and all the libraries needed, and the third one is to create a program that listens to our control knob and converts that to MIDI data. And to achieve this, we're going to use an ADC or analog to digital converter, which can read voltages, turn them into numbers, and those numbers we will then convert to MIDI signals. So let's begin by assembling the hardware. We're using a Raspberry Pi here. At the moment, those are hard to find, but a lot of you should still have one of these in their drawers somewhere. Next, here's a breadboard for prototyping circuits. You can plug in your electronic components here instead of soldering them. This small board will connect a Raspberry Pi to the breadboard. I'm using a USB to DIN MIDI interface today. In a later stage, we might move to a GPIO port solution, but USB has some advantages over that. We also need an SD card to store the operating system on. And here are some wires to connect our electronic components. And of course we need some faders and knobs to control our MIDI equipment. Last but not least, here's an 8-bit analog to digital converter chip. We might also need an LC display in the future for displaying information what our controller is doing at the moment. Also two resistors are needed, which I'll talk about later. Instead of buying all these parts separately, you can also buy this beginner's electronics set by a company called Freenove and link is in this video's description and this is not sponsored. Now, install the Raspberry and operating system on your Raspberry Pi. Insert an SD card into your PC, then download and install and launch the Raspberry Pi Imager. Select Other and then select the 64-bit operating system. Select your SD card as a storage media, then click the cogwheel icon and set up your Wi-Fi connection and also turn on SSH or Secure Shell. Then click Right and wait until the installation has finished. Now, insert the SD card into your Raspberry Pi, connect it to a video input and turn it on by connecting the USB power cable. Once booted, click the start menu, select preferences and then Raspberry Pi configuration. Here, set the headless display resolution to full HD and also turn on the I2C interface and the VNC server. This will enable you to use the Raspberry Pi remotely. And after that, install any mandatory system upgrades and reboot. Back on your Windows PC, download and install and run the VNC viewer. Set up a new connection to raspberrypi.local and the account name is pi and the default password is raspberry. With a new remote control, let's install some prerequisite software. We'll write a software in C, so we need to install some so-called libraries, which are small utility programs written by other people that will make your progress easier by providing certain functions you don't need to program yourself then. The first library is called Wiring Pi. This provides a lot of routines for interacting with hardware connected to the Raspberry Pi's GPIO port, which is this row of pins here. You can install it using the command shown on screen now. To enter these commands, click the terminal icon on the top left of the screen. After installing, run the GPIO-V command. This should print some system details on the screen. On some systems, you need to add user slash local slash lib the place where the wiring pi is installed to your library path. To do that, edit the file slash etc slash ld dot so dot conf and add a line containing only slash user slash local slash lib. Then save the changes and exit the editor. Next, let's install the i2c tools by typing sudo apt-get install i2c tools. After installing, the command i2c detect minus y1 should show you 
preview the results seen on screen right now. Next, install libasound to dev. This contains useful functions to use Linux also sound system for accessing the MIDI ports. Next, let's download some example programs by Freenove using the git clone command seen on screen now. Inside that folder, there's another library usable for ADC devices that we need to install now. So change to the lib folder and execute that build command. All of the prerequisites are installed and now we need to build the hardware. Okay, begin with the breadboard and the GPIO connector board. Then add the analog to digital converter or ADC with its notch facing right. Then add one of the potentiometers in any place you like. Now add the wires. Basically, the two bottom rows of the breadboard are connected horizontally and they are used as power supply and ground here. So connect one of the 3.3 volt support pins to the plus row and one ground pin to the minus row. Now the left pin of the potentiometer is connected to plus and the right one to minus. The middle pin will go into the first pin of the ADC for measuring the voltage on the potentiometer. The hardware address pins of the ADC and the analog ground and oscillator switch pins will all be grounded. The data input and output ports are both connected to their GPIO counterparts. They need to be backed up by the power supply, which need to be secured with 10 kilo ohm resistors, one each. Last but not least, Connect the voltage and reference voltage pins of the ADC to the 3.3 volt pin of the Raspberry Pi. And that should be enough for our first setup. Let's create a filter control with this with some copy and paste C programming. The best way to start is to load one of the example codes, in this case chapter 7 ADC. For editing the code, you can use the Genie editor that comes with the Raspbian operating system. It's good enough for our purposes. As you can see here, this is a fairly simple program. We're loading the wiring pi library, the standard input-output library and the ADC library, all of which we installed previously. The ADC library provides some useful functions that dramatically reduce the amount of code you need to write yourself. So in this example, a new ADC device instance is created. We then determine the type of chip installed and create an instance of the library used for that chip. We then enter an endless loop, in which we read the voltage on the A null pin to which a potentiometer is connected. Then we convert the 8-bit number to the actual voltage by dividing it by 255 and multiplying it by 3.3 and then we print the result to the screen. Now let's compile this program. When compiling such simple projects, you need to specify the libraries you're using with the minus L parameter followed by the name of the library. So here the command is g++ then file name minus o output name minus l wiring pi minus l adc device this should compile without errors and when you list the directory now there should be a new executable there that you can start by entering its file name into the shell now turn the potentiometer and watch the screen output it should show you the raw number the adc picked up and the voltage represented by that number as you probably have guessed, this works because a potentiometer is an adjustable resistor, or better, two adjustable resistors, divided by a movable contact pin. Turning the potentiometer increases or decreases the resistance of one side of this resistor, and by the formula U equals R times I, where U is the voltage, R is the resistance, and I is the current, we can see the voltage must follow the strength of the resistor. The stronger the resistor, the harder the current has to push, so to speak. Now let's add some MIDI functionality to this code. We want to use the ALSA sound system for this, so let's include the A sound lib library. Next, we need a couple of more variables to store things in we need for operating our MIDI controller. Status is a number which reports if the MIDI port is functional or not. We're using ALSA's raw MIDI mode here, so the mode variable will be used to communicate that to ALSA. ALSA has more MIDI modes, for example a sequencer, which might come in handy in the future, but for today this will do. We also need to define a MIDI out port, which we'll aptly name 
MIDI out. The MIDI out port will be referenced by its hardware name inside the Linux operating system. And you can find that name by typing a MIDI minus L into the shell. Great, we have all variables in place. Now in the main function, let's create a MIDI port instance. This is achieved with the snd underscore raw MIDI underscore open command. This function takes four parameters. The first one being a MIDI input, the second one being a MIDI output, the hardware interface name and the mode we defined previously. As we're currently not working with the MIDI import, the first parameter can be null. Also, let's catch any errors that might occur. Now we can continue in the while loop here. Remember, this line reads the voltage the ADC picked up and returns it as a number between 0 and 255. As MIDI control changes range from 0 to 127, we need to divide this value by 2 and then convert it to an integer. Let's also print that value on screen. Now we need to convert the value we picked up and divided by 2 to an actual MIDI control change command. For this we define an array of three chars. The parts of this array together define the MIDI command you're sending. The first part is the number of the type of command you're sending. The second number, in case of control changes, is the CC number. And the third number is the value we picked up with the ADC. Let's look up the MIDI documentation. As you can see here, MIDI commands are determined by a 4-bit binary number and the number for control changes is 1011. And also, we need to convert this to hexadecimal, which results in B0. Hexadecimal numbers are tagged with a null x in C++, so the first value here is null x b null. On the list of control changes, we can see that filter cutoff frequency has the number 74 in the general MIDI standard. And the third value is, as I said before, the number our ADC gave us. So a resulting MIDI command reads null xb null 74 MIDI value. Now we can send that command to a MIDI interface using the snd underscore raw MIDI underscore write command, which takes three parameters. The interface we're sending to, the MIDI command, command and the length of that command. Once again, let's capture any errors. The last thing I want to do here is to make sure we only send data when there was actually a change, that is, when you moved the controller. So let's define a variable previous value and only send the command when the previous value is not equal to the value the ADC picked up currently. If the command was sent successfully, we will then set the previous value to the current value and continue. My last change here will be to set the delay from 100 to 10 milliseconds so a controller reacts more quickly. Now let's compile this. There will be some warnings because we're using integers in an array of chars, but you can just ignore these and run the program anyway. And here's the big moment. Does this work? Oh, by the way, if you like content like this, and if you want to see some more episodes of this series, please press the like button and consider subscribing to my channel. And if you want to support what I'm doing here financially, you can become a Patreon member or a channel member using the button under this video. Thank you very much. Yeah, and that's it for today. The first steps towards your own MIDI controller using a Raspberry Pi and some hardware you probably have at home. And if this video catches on, we'll continue this by adding a screen which can display information about what you're doing at the moment, some buttons for mode selection and setup, and perhaps later we'll also turn this into a bare metal system that runs without the Linux operating system. So we'll have a controller that is operable within a few seconds after turning on.
on. And if you want to see that happening, please consider subscribing to my channel and giving this video a like. As always, thanks for watching and see you again very, very soon. Bye bye.